Welcome back, everybody, to the Sam McKee Memorial Broadcast set. Dave Little with you. And I'm joined by Freddie Hudson, longtime lover of harness racing, especially back in the days of Yonkers and Roosevelt, back in the heyday in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he's written a very interesting book by the name of The Super Fecta Trial. Freddie, thanks so much for spending a couple of minutes with us. Uh, th thank you for having me, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, let's talk a little bit about The Super Fecta Trial. You know, you get a title like that, and you assume that there were some nefarious acts taken in order to fix superfectas. And in fact, that wasn't the case at all in this uh, particular instance. No, it was all on circumstantial evidence. Uh, that's why none of the guys were um, convicted. And they, were all, they all end up being acquitted. And really it was, um, as they said after the trial was over, it was a tax case. So how indeed, uh, what were the actions that caused, uh, I'm assuming the feds, to get involved? and to start investigating uh, these uh, super effectors. Because at the time, there was only one super effect that night, and that was a very special bet. Uh, correct. Uh, what took place was there was a woman that was cashing large amounts of tickets of the super effector at OTB parlors th throughout New York. And so it brought attention to the um, OTB people, and then the OTB people basically started to, uh, they called the FBI and the Internal Revenue Service, and then they started to do an investigation on it, they called um, Roosevelt Raceway up and spoke with uh, their security and George Morton Levy. And as soon as George Morton Levy heard that there was an investigation by the FBI going on on the superfector, he suspended the races. Um, it was too easy for someone with a large amount of money to um, w hit the superfector just by eliminating the two longest shots on the program. So the fact of the matter is that there weren't really any nefarious acts taken on the Superfecta. The only thing that raised suspicion was this young lady who was cashing these tickets. So am I to understand that if she hadn't done that, then maybe there would be no Superfecta trial? Po possibly. Uh, the other thing that they found out was that when, they, when she was cashing the tickets, she wasn't alone. There was like multiples of other people cashing Superfecta tickets all coming out from the same run. Uh, meaning that they had basically computerized these tickets at OTB and they could see that one person had purchased the tickets and they had multiples of people cashing the tickets. Now, how did uh, Mr. Morton Levy feel about this? He was obviously the president of Roosevelt Raceway. Uh, you know, what was his reaction to this? He couldn't have been too happy. He did not feel that any of the drivers were involved in race fixing. And he basically eliminated the superfecta immediately because he felt it was it was too easy for a good handicapper with a large bankroll to um, hit the superfector without any fixing. And one of the things that came it took place in the trial was the uh, statistic person from the OTB was asked by one of the attorneys, um, "Is it possible to?" Um, hit the superfector without bribing a driver and the guy said absolutely 100 percent one of the excerpts that i saw in the book was a quote from carmen abatello and he was obviously he was voted by the new york city chapter of the united states harness Rider association the driver of the century in the empire state and uh, Carmine was pretty nervous about what was going on, I'm sure, along with a lot of other drivers, because none of them were found guilty of any wrongdoing. Oh, absolutely. And none of them did anything wrong. If, if <laughs> it, it was just so bizarre. Uh, Car Carmine said, you know, he, he knew he didn't do anything wrong, but he was just so worried because it was in the hands of the, of the jury to decide whether he did something wrong. So it was really just a matter of the FBI overreacting? Um, Yes, and the, the other thing that should be pointed out is this whole superfector trial and all the races involved were 40-some-odd races, and they took place in a three-month period. Tell me, Freddie, what was the aftermath of uh, when all the dust cleared with the, uh, uh, the Fed's investigation and the trial and everybody being called to the stand and everybody being questioned, the investigation is over, everything is done. What was the aftermath of the superfector trial? Um, many of the drivers all returned to driving and resumed, resumed their careers. Uh, my dad took it hard. Um, he did, never recovered from it. Uh, Maurice Pusey um, never recovered from it. Billy Meyer never recovered from it. Uh, but here's a comical thing was that the district attorney of Nassau County, uh, he was one of the people that he subpoenaed 700 people from the Roosevelt Raceway to come in for a hearing. Uh, I was one of them by that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, it was just uh, 600 people showed up. He used three courtrooms. 
Um, he was all over the press talking about the super effective races being fixed. Uh, the man, uh, Dennis Dillon, who was in charge of the task force, um, he actually ran for district attorney of Nassau County and got elected and then put the other guy, William Kahn, was sentenced and put to jail for um, fraud to Nassau County a year later. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And just, a, just an incredible series of events. You know, Freddie, we appreciate you spending a couple of minutes with us. Can you just reflect a little bit on harness racing in New York in the old days, especially out on Long Island? How uh, big a track, how important a track, how impactful a track was Roosevelt Raceway? R racing at Roosevelt Raceway, I kind of grew up at Roosevelt Raceway. Uh, when you went out after the races, everyone knew you. Um, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, you had 20,000 people. On Fridays and Saturdays, you had 30,000 people. For like the big race, the international, the, I think the, they had 55,000 people one time. My goodness. The, it was just so tremendous. And it was just like, um, I don't think anyone ever thought it would end. Um, I will also point out like during the Superfector trial, what Levy and um, Tim Rooney were scared of was that if any of the drivers were convicted, it could end harness racing, and possibly if any of these convictions ever took place, there may have never been a Meadowlands. Was there any fallback? Uh, you mentioned Tim Rooney. Was there any, uh, you know, splashback that had any ill effects on Yonkers Raceway and uh, on their raceway and their, and their track operation? Um, the handles dropped after the Superfector trial and after the Superfector scandal, but uh, they they did recover, and you know, and racing did resume. Tell us, Freddie, how can everybody get a copy of the Superfecta trial? Um, it's on Amazon, and it's a bestseller on Amazon. And tonight, you can get them over here signed. <laughs> and, and if you go to ustrots.com, you can probably find a link over there to get a signed copy, too. All right, so you'll sign a copy for them. Will you also take a picture with them, Freddie? Uh, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Freddie Hudson, thanks so much for spending a couple of minutes with us. The author of the Superfecta trial. Pick one up. Say hello to Freddie right here, right now at the Meadowlands. Once again, Freddie Hudson, thanks so much for spending a few minutes okay. with us. Uh, thank you, Dave, for having me.